That's anything, Neil? I think that's that's everything. Yeah. <laughs> Trans okay. Pan, pan spectral uh, okay. gravitational waves. Yep. Yeah. <clears throat> Okay, I thank again our speaker on behalf of all this community that is gathered around these uh, gravitational wave lectures for the Scuola Superiore Meridionale. And I will be listening with a lot of interest to what Neil will present us. Go ahead, Neil. Well, thank you very much for the present, for the introduction. Um, I am very much looking forward to uh, future lectures and schools where we can all be in person, interacting and enjoying some great food in Italy. I happen to be in Italy right now, but just a little further north. So uh, yeah, I'm, I'm very much looking forward to getting back to doing this the old fashioned way, but uh, happy to have you all online today. So <clears throat> in the in some of the earlier lectures, you've heard about some of the, the science that we hope to do and have been doing with gravitational wave detection, some of the incredible technology that goes into these detectors. And today I wanna to say a little bit about how we go from just the raw output of the detectors and extract the information. So how do we go from these time series that come out of the detectors and and find out all these incredible things about the universe? So that's the, um, that's the topic for today. And I've got a couple of um, resources listed here. I'll, I'll make the uh, slides available so there are some, uh, now these selection of papers are very, um, you know, biased. Uh, they're my own uh, papers and mostly uh, I, I helped co-write the first one, which was the LIGO Virgo paper, which was a guide to LIGO Virgo detector noise and the extraction of transient gravitational wave signals. I highly recommend that, <clears throat> that paper. It's uh, a, a team of us worked on on that, and uh, I, I think that it really filled a hole that um, there are hundreds and hundreds of papers scattered throughout the literature, but that's one that brings a lot of um, what you need to know, especially if you're starting out in the field. It contains uh, a lot of a lot of the information you need and also point you to other references. Uh, a couple of years back, I gave a series of lectures at uh, the SASFE, um, lectures in, in Switzerland, and that got put into a book. And so I have a book chapter, and you can pick it up. I've got a Dropbox link there where you can you can grab hold of that chapter without having to buy the book. And also <clears throat> with Joe Romano, um, I wrote uh, a Living Reviews article on detecting stochastic gravitational waves, but it also covers a lot of just the general principles of how we go about um, gravitational wave extraction and some of the content from the lectures is is taken from that review article. So, and then of course there's some um, some great books on gravitational wave analysis that you probably are familiar with as well. So these are just some of the resources if you want to learn more. Um, and I'm going to stop partway through. <clears throat> Get questions. If you have a pressing question, I'm not exactly sure with Microsoft Teams how you jump in and do that. But if there's something that you uh, you uh, really just you know something missing or you really want to know, um, please do let me know, and I'll um, I'll try and uh, answer that question. But I'm not quite sure how that works. I'm used to Zoom, so this is a little bit new for me. The Microsoft Teams. All right. So some of the topics I'm going to go over. <clears throat> The first thing is how does how do we go from the gravitational waves um, to the response of the detectors? So how does the output of the detector relate to the gravitational waves um, coming in? That then leads to things like uh, source like localization, and then I'm going to get into just the basics of how the data is analyzed. Talk about the statistical framework of the analysis, how we search for the signals, then how we um, infer their physical properties, the, for example, the masses and the spins and the sky location and all that sort of thing. And then one of the, and I'm going to kind of get into more recent developments and more advanced material, uh, including trans-dimensional modeling, uh, modeling the noise. I mean, you hear a lot of, most of the uh, 
references and talks you'll hear on gravitational waves will all be about the signals. But what's equally important when you're trying to understand what's going on with the detectors is understanding the noise and modeling the noise. Because if you do not model the noise correctly, that's going to bias the extraction of the signals and finish with a, <clears throat> a few recent developments in, in, that, in that line. OK, so <clears throat> the, uh, this animation um, was produced by the LIGO Virgo collaboration. It shows um, in vastly exaggerated scale the effect of the strain of the first ever detected gravitational wave um, coming through the Earth. If the Earth was a big ball of jelly and uh, gravitational waves were far more powerful than what they are, that would have been the um, stretching and squeezing pattern that happened to the whole Earth. And as you can see that the gravitational waves came up um, from that signal coming up through Africa, um, first hitting the LIGO uh, Livingston detector and then propagating on to the LIGO Hanford detector. So in, in wanting to model the response to the detectors, <clears throat> you've got the gravitational wave signal coming in and then you've got the two detectors shown in red here with their orientations, the one in uh, Livingston, Louisiana, and the one in um, Hanford, Washington. And you see that you get um, the, the responses here to that gravitational wave signal. And this is just a purely theoretical response, right? Not taking into account the, uh, the noise. And you'll see that the signal arrived just slightly earlier in the Livingston detector, about seven milliseconds before it arrived in Hanford. <clears throat> You'll also see that there, the two signals are also phase shifted, not quite by pi, but by 2.9 radians. And also the signal was slightly um, louder in Hanford, um, about uh, 1.24 times louder in Hanford than Livingston. So uh, that, that all comes, this calculation all comes from the antenna response, which depends on uh, where the gravitational waves are coming from and their polarization gives you these different um, amplitudes, phase shifts and time delays. And that then allows us to figure out where on the sky these signals come from. <clears throat> now, gravitational wave detectors are actually pretty simple to understand how they work. Um, they're all, all of the time, of, sorry, all of the gravitational wave detectors that are currently in operation uh, are time of flight detectors. Earlier, we had various kinds of uh, resonant acoustic uh, detectors, bar detectors, but now the, the main detectors are all uh, laser interferometers or pulsar timing. And what they're all measuring in slightly different ways <clears throat> is the time delays imparted by the gravitational waves um, along the arms of the detector. <clears throat> so that's true for the ground-based detectors, the future space-based LISA detector, and then the pulsar timing arrays. <clears throat> so if you actually want to calculate the response, what you need to do is calculate these time delays. So for pulsar timing, <clears throat> it's very directly, just the, the time delay is exactly what you measure. So the, the pulsars, rapidly rotating neutron stars with a uh, sort of lighthouse beam of radio waves going out, those radio pulses arriving just either slightly earlier or slightly later than they would in the absence of gravitational waves. And because we, they're incredibly um, regular rotators, those slight delays are something we can measure. We're talking, uh, you know, tens of nanoseconds uh, per perturbations due to gravitational waves. And we're able to, you know, search for those. And so it's a direct time delay measurement. A, a very early method that has been used for looking for gravitational waves is um, spacecraft uh, Doppler tracking. And there it's actually <clears throat> the time derivative of that um, time delay is actually what you're measuring. So it's a frequency shift. And then if you go to something like uh, a laser interferometer, it's a little bit more complicated geometry because you've got to bounce the, um, the laser signal off a mirror and then recombine it. <clears throat> And there, what you're actually measuring is the um, the time delay, but it's sort of indirect because it's from the um, phase shift. So here, nu naught is the gravitational wave frequency. Sorry, 
not the gravitational wave frequency, the laser frequency. And so <clears throat> the problem here is that if the laser frequency isn't perfectly constant, then you would interpret that as a phase shift. So since we can't build, you know, perfect lasers, what we have to do is set up a Michelson-like topology for the detection so that the um, signals going up and back each of the, the arms of the detector, um, when they recombine, we're actually canceling the majority of the laser phase noise. So that's, um, that's why we have to use this Michelson-like uh, topology. And that's also true for the um, future space-based detectors as well. <clears throat> but the basic point is you're trying just to calculate the time of flight of photons in a perturbed space-time. And in the case of um, LIGO, LISA, and then pulsar timing, what really differentiates them, it's exactly the same calculation for all, all types of um, gravitational wave detectors that are currently operating. <clears throat> but really, it's the difference between the um, arm length of the detector and the wavelength of the gravitational wave. In the case of LIGO, the um, gravitational wavelengths vastly exceed the arm lengths. <clears throat> For the case of LISA, they're kind of comparable. Um, in some part of the frequency spectrum, the gravitational wavelength is, is uh, long compared to the LISA arms. In other parts at higher frequencies, it's short compared to the LISA arms. Whereas with pulsar timing, you're always in the regime where the um, <clears throat> gravitational wavelength is much shorter than the distance between the Earth and any of these pulsars, which are typically, you know, kiloparsecs away. <clears throat> but aside from that, the calculation is identical for calculating the response of LIGO, LISA, and pulsar timing. <clears throat> so I'm not going to go through all the details of the calculation, but really it's pretty simple. You take a, for example, a perturbed um, Minkowski space with a gravitational wave signal, say, propagating in the uh, Z direction. So you've got the plus and the cross polarizations here. <clears throat> and then you can do a little change of variables <clears throat> to uh, um, T minus Z and T plus Z so that they're propagating in the positive Z direction so that the gravitational wave is just a function of this, this U coordinate. <clears throat> and then it's a very simple calculation because this metric does not depend on um, explicitly, it does not depend on V, uh, X or Y. So that gives you three um, conserved quantities. So you don't even have to like integrating to find the <clears throat> um, photon geodesics is really simple because you have four constants of the motion. So it's a fully uh, reduced to quadrature system. So it's very easy then because you've also got the normalization condition. So you don't even have to like solve any differential equations. You can just directly calculate the um, the time delay because you've got all these constants of the motion in this in this metric, and the result <clears throat> is pretty simple to work through. And you get on a one-way path from um, one location to another location. Here, the time delay depends on the. This is the uh, a hat is the direction that the uh, electromagnetic signal is is going. This symbol here is the tensor product. And that's just contracted with the um, antiderivative of the gravitational wave. <clears throat> Here, k, k hat is the direction that the gravitational wave is propagating. <clears throat> and uh, yeah, so you've got the polarization tensors, and that's it. That's the that formula there, which is the one-way time delay between two locations. It's all that you need to know to calculate the response of any of these gravitational wave detectors that we currently use. So <clears throat> the uh, if you want to you know introduce coordinates now, so if the source happens to be in the um, in spherical coordinates in the uh, latitude and longitude theta and phi, then you introduce a couple of other uh, vectors u and v, which are in the direction orthogonal to the line of sight to that. And you set up your um, polarization tensors. <clears throat> and then there's an angle between the, see the source doesn't know how you've set up your coordinate system. So there's an angle uh, psi here, which relates the orientation of your coordinate system and the principal polarization 
um, vectors for the source, which uh, indicated here P and Q. And so there's a rotation there since the tensor goes as cosine two psi and sine two psi. And now you can just go through and calculate the um, antenna response. <clears throat> and so for a laser interferometer, you've got four of these time delays. You've got from one to two, and then two to four, and then you subtract off one to three, three to four, and that um, combination gives you the total time delay. And you can work here in the limit that the gravitational wavelength is much larger than the arm length, and it simplifies just down to, um, you've got the vectors A and B, which are along the arms of the detector, and it's just the, the difference of those tensor products contracted in with the gravitational wave, and that's the response. And then when you calculate that out, um, including the polarization tensors there, you just calculate out all of these inner products, and you get these various factors here. And when you put it all together, you then get the, the total response is just uh, what we call F plus the um, F cross the antenna pattern for the cross polarization, and just a simple bit of uh, algebra, you get the response function here for the for a ground-based gravitational wave detector in the theta and phi direction with a polarization angle psi. Um, <clears throat> and so it's yeah, all of this was just calculating photon propagation in a perturbed spacetime. So for the um, the ground-based type detectors, which work in the this long wavelength limit, this is the <clears throat> um, plus polarization response as a function of sky location, the cross polarization, and then if you actually form up in quadrature, that's the polarization average response, which I'm sure you've seen before, kind of this dimpled peanut-like shape. Um, so here in this in this plot, the detector lies. Um, in say this is the x and the y plane and then the vertical direction the z direction so uh, they respond most strongly directly above the detector directly below the detector and there's a couple there's four nulls um, almost nulls in the in the plane of the detector but they're fairly um, all sky response so just to show you for the um, existing and and future uh, terrestrial network. We've got the Hanford H, Livingston L, Virgo V, uh, soon to be India, and uh, currently operating uh, Kagra detectors. And when you superimpose their antenna patterns, you see the Hanford detector, um, most sensitive directly over the US and then down a little bit south of Africa. And then Livingston detector slightly rotated. And you'll see that for the Virgo detector, kind of the complementary, of course, it's centered over, over Pisa. And then it's also got uh, strong responses in the southern hemisphere. In the future, when we have the LIGO India detector, that's going to be an entirely new um, coverage of the sky. And the Kagra detector joined the network at the end of the uh, third um, observing run uh, with not great sensitivity, but it also brings in a very different um, coverage of the sky. And it's the combination of these different antenna patterns and also the time delays for when gravitational waves arrive at each of these detectors is how we uh, figure out where the gravitational waves are coming from. These are fairly broad um, responses on the sky, so the antenna patterns aren't super informative, so we get most of the information from the time delays. So um, with just two detectors, uh, the, the uh, line of equal arrival time defines a ring on the sky, whereas with three detectors, so if you combine the, say, two LIGO detectors and also Virgo, that actually um, the equal time delay rings then pick out two points two possible points on the sky where the signal could be coming from. And then that uh, tie kind of gets broken by the antenna response. So in general, if you say just have a single detector, 
This is a sort of a map of, of the sky localization. It's just a broad blobs. Wouldn't be very useful for trying to um, coordinate with, say, an electromagnetic observer. With, <clears throat> uh, say, two detectors, you now get this ring on the sky and just the areas that were in those sort of blobs of the two antenna patterns kind of get lit up. And then when you have three detectors, it can really pin it down to, um, you know, a much smaller location on the sky. And we had a, a really interesting example of this with the first binary neutron star merger, GW170817, because if you just had the two LIGO detectors, oh, this is also showing the ring for Virgo as well, but um, I think the, the shaded here is the combined antenna response for the two LIGO detectors. So these are the three equal time delay rings. So equal time delay between, say, the Hamford and Livingston detector, the equal time delay between Hamford and Virgo, and Hamford, sorry, and uh, Livingston and Virgo. So that gets us these three rings, which intersect at these two points. So it could have been at either of these two sky locations, just based on time delays, with some sort of you know error to that because the time of arrival is not measured perfectly. So these rings are actually kind of fat. So there's um, narrowed it down to a couple of regions on the sky. But then if you actually look at the Virgo antenna pattern, you see that Virgo was most sensitive to the upper of the two um, locations. <clears throat> and the fact that the signal wasn't really detected in Virgo, it was, um, <clears throat> it was too quiet, Virgo would have seen it if it was at this um, sky location, but because Virgo really didn't see it, that then pinned it down to being this um, lower intersection point. So that narrowed it down to this much smaller region of the sky because uh, if it had been up in this top location, Virgo would have seen it as well. So that narrowed it down. And then because that was such a narrow region combined also with the the Fermi and integral um, gamma ray detections, we got, you know, a very tight localization, which then meant there was only a relatively small number of galaxies that had to be searched over, and we were able to find um, the electromagnetic counterpart, which of course was um, allowed incredible science to be done, uh, learning about our first ever definite kilonova connected with a, a neutron star in spiral. Now, when you go beyond the um, this low frequency approximation or long wavelength approximation equivalently, so you go from what we have for the ground-based detectors and you go to something that's um, appropriate for LISA or, or pulsar timing, things get a little bit more complicated because you have this sort of standard antenna response here, but you end up with this sync function which is a finite arm length connection correction. So that sort of decays as one over the frequency when you get up to frequencies um, where, you know, where the wavelengths are now much shorter than the detector. And then you've got this overall phase um, at the midpoint of the arm. But this, this, this function here goes to one in the limit for LIGO, uh, but it's critical for LISA and pulsar timing. So if you actually look for pulsar timing, this is actually for a case where the product of the frequency and the distance to the pulsar, so the gravitational wave, wave frequency times the distance to the pulsar is 10, and I put the polarization angle at zero, you get this um, almost like a like an artichoke or something. You've got this multi, um, you've got all these nulls from that sync function. And so it's a way more complicated antenna pattern response <clears throat> in the case of, um, when the, when the gravitational waves actually get shorter than the um, arm length. So you get these much more complicated responses. Similar for LISA, this is what the LISA antenna response looks like um, in the low frequency. So this is for, you know, frequencies, say, down around a tenth of a millihertz or so, or even one millihertz. So there the gravitational waves are still, um, the wavelengths are quite a bit longer than the um, arm lengths. And it the same sort of antenna pattern we saw for the ground-based detectors, but now, you know, as LISA moves across the sky, it sweeps the antenna pattern around. Now, the movie on the left showing the LISA orbital pattern 
and the um, and the movie on the right are actually not running at quite the same rate. So um, I haven't figured out how to synchronize those, but you can see the response sort of rolls across the sky. But when you go up from low frequencies, and this is now um, in the frame of the detector. So this is along the um, the detector arms are in in the uh, the equatorial plane here. So you've got the standard low frequency response, but, you, but as you go up in frequency, you see you get much more complicated antenna patterns, and then you get up to say you know 20 millihertz, and you get this much more complicated pattern here with all sorts of nulls. And so we start getting over to something much more like um, what we have with the uh, pulsar timing sort of situation where it turns into an artichoke from a peanut. <clears throat> yeah, and so the same thing um, at higher frequencies, the, the antenna pattern as it sweeps across the sky is a much more interesting uh, thing to watch. It's kind of like, like an old lava lamp or something like that. You could just watch this for hours. Okay, so that's just a little bit on how we get from the gravitational wave signal to the response of the detectors. Now, how do we um, extract the signals? Well, pretty much everything we, we do just really dates back um, a couple of hundred years to the work of Laplace and Gauss. Um, so Laplace essentially developed Bayesian inference and Gauss developed um, a lot of what we now know as like a frequentist sort of approach. He developed the maximum likelihood estimation and uh, and the normal distribution for noise. Um, Laplace actually later explained why a normal or Gaussian distribution was so ubiquitous for, for noise um, through his uh, first version of the central limit theorem. So let's just go through um, the what Gauss, so Gauss, I, I'm trying to remember what problem it was. It was a problem in astronomy that Gauss was trying to solve where he came up with the idea of, of this maximum likelihood estimate. So the basic idea is if you have a collection of data points, which I'm showing here on the left, and these have you know some kind of error bars on them, some uncertainties, and then you have showing here on the right some kind of a model that you are using to say fit the data, then what Gauss um, pointed out was that if you take the data and you subtract the model, if your model is correctly um, describing the process that generated this data, then all you should have left is, is the noise. So data minus your model should just be noise. It should be consistent with your noise model. So this is why modeling the noise is so important because what you're trying to do is take the data that comes out from the gravitational wave detectors, subtract off whatever model you have, and keep on adjusting that model and adjusting it until what is left is consistent with your model of the noise. So you can see if your model of the noise is incorrect, then it's going to bias your um, what you extract from the data because you keep on adjusting your model, which might be you know something that came from solving Einstein's equations for a binary system. If you haven't modeled the noise correctly, then the so-called residuals, the data minus the model, um, you're trying to match it to some kind of noise that actually isn't uh, the, the noise we see in the detectors. So in the LIGO and the Virgo detectors, the noise is uh, Gaussian, you know, a good part of the time, but not always. Uh, it's fairly stationary. That means that the power spectrum, the uh, if you do a go to the frequency domain and calculate the uh, the power spectrum, it's fairly constant in time. But if you if you compare it, say. 10, 20 minutes apart, you'll actually see that the spectrum drifts a bit. Uh, it sort of tends to go up and down. There's various lines and features that move around. So it's not what we call stationary. The statistical properties of the noise are changing with time. 
Um, so you have to uh, take all of that into account. Otherwise, you're going to bias your um, measurements. And one of the big problems with the LIGO and Virgo detectors is we have these transients. <clears throat> so it's going along, it's nice and gaussian, there'll be a pop or a crack or like an old record, which is what we call a glitch. Um, so some kind of a localized like burst, it's really a signal from the instrument. We don't know what causes a lot of them, but uh, some of them are understood where they come from. A lot of them aren't. And there, there's some kind of like pop or crackle, maybe like some little defect releasing or something, some release in a in a crystal. And what we have to watch out for is that those produce, they're very signal-like, they're very localized in time and frequency, and we could mistake them for signals. So we have to worry about those when modeling um, modeling the noise so we don't kid ourselves and think that we've actually detected a signal when, in fact, we're picking up a, a pop or a crackle in the detectors. <clears throat> so following, uh, following Gauss, you take, you know, saying that the total data D is the sum of the signal H plus the noise N, and you form up the residual, so data minus your model should just be noise. And then uh, what in the example I was showing you, this was noise that was uncorrelated between samples, and it actually had the same um, noise variance for every every sample. And so the probability of observing um, each instance of the noise here at each timestamp is just given by this Gaussian distribution. So then the probability of observing this collection is just the product of the individual uh, likelihoods. And that leads to this um, expression here for the probability of observing just the noise, which is the same as the probability of observing the data minus your model if your model is correct. So this is the likelihood function that we use. So we just substitute in the data minus the model. Um, <clears throat> and if the noise were Gaussian, then you could uh, use this as your likelihood. So it's the likelihood of observing um, the data given that model. And in a lot of the analyses we do, we use this likelihood function, uh, but sometimes we have to make some corrections to it. We have to, for, for example, first subtract out any terms that are non-Gaussian. So in addition to subtracting out the signal, the gravitational wave signal, we might also have to subtract what I call instrument signals. Um, coherent pops or crackles from the instruments uh, also have to be subtracted before we get down to the um, this, this Gaussian form here. But this is basically the, the uh, what we use in all of gravitational wave data analysis is inspired by this likelihood function that Gauss wrote down a couple of hundred years ago. <clears throat> Um, more generally, the individual noise samples can be correlated. So rather than just the, um, the expression I had before, instead you have to have this uh, noise correlation matrix in here. This is actually the inverse of the noise correlation matrix. But the example I gave you was known as stationary white noise, which means the individual samples are uncorrelated in time. So each time uh, each measurement is completely uncorrelated. And not only that, it actually has the same noise variance for every sample, right? So that's the very simplest example there is stationary white noise, where every sample has the same noise level and they're completely uncorrelated. So if you put in just this little Kronecker delta here, you get back the expression I had on the previous slide. <clears throat> we recognize this quantity in the exponent as the chi-squared goodness of fit. I'm using the uh, Einstein summation convention here where repeated indices are summed over. <clears throat> and we denote this um, using like a bra -ket notation, like we do in quantum mechanics for this uh, inner product here of the data minus the, um, the model. And this is the so-called noise weighted inner product um, because here's the noise weighting uh, given by the noise correlation matrix or the inverse of it here. So that's that there is the definition of this noise weighted in a product. So you'll see this in uh, 
in pretty much every application in gravitational wave data analysis, you'll have this noise weighted in a product here. It's often shown um, as an integral in the frequency domain, which I have on this slide here. So, um, oh, this actually, sorry, not an integral. This one's as a sum in frequencies. You'll often see that uh, they take the limit that the frequency, that the, uh, the sum goes over to an integral. Of course, in practice, we have a finite amount of data so that it's actually um, it's actually really a sum, not an integral. And so we've got <clears throat> the Fourier transform of of time stream A, Fourier transform of B, complex conjugate here, add those together, and that's what it looks like in the frequency domain. <clears throat> now, the reason that the analysis, <clears throat> a lot of the um, LIGO Virgo analyses are done in the frequency domain is that <clears throat> if you had to do this calculation in the time domain, you know, we're, we're, we're collecting the data in LIGO at 16,000 samples a second and in Virgo at like 20,000 samples a second. So if you imagine if you want to analyze, say, you know, a few seconds worth of data or a minute's worth of data, you've got hundreds of thousands of samples. So if you wanted to calculate this noise correlation matrix in the time domain, you would have to invert, say, a thousand by a thousand, sorry, hundred thousand by a hundred thousand matrix, and the cost of inverting a matrix, if it's a generally, you know, a general matrix, goes as that dimension cubed. So that's incredibly costly <clears throat> to actually invert that matrix. So if the data happens to be stationary, that is, if the statistical properties are unchanging with time then <clears throat> that correlation matrix is actually diagonal in the frequency domain. So it's much easier to invert a diagonal matrix because the cost just goes like the number of points, not like the number of points cubed. So under the assumption that the noise is stationary, you, you can save hugely by going to the um, frequency domain. Now that is not possible for pulsar timing the noise is very much not stationary. And what's more, the data is not collected on a regular, at a regular cadence. The samples um, are not collected at a, <clears throat> you know, we don't get telescope time um, to be able to say sample the, the pulsars every day at the same time. So sometimes there'll be maybe two weeks between measurements, sometimes three, sometimes longer. Um, it varies. <clears throat> so the data is not uniform in time, so it's very difficult to do, say, a Fourier transform. So when we're doing pulsar timing, we actually have to invert the matrix um, in the time domain, <clears throat> which makes it extremely expensive. Uh, now, the difference is we're taking samples once every couple of weeks. We've now got data sets that span, say, up to 20 years. It's still not a huge number of data points, so um, inverting the matrix is doable, but uh, it definitely makes pulsar timing way more costly uh, computationally than it does for LIGO-Virgo analyses where we um, are able to, well, at least we assume we can move to the frequency domain <clears throat> if we assume the noise is stationary. Um, so I've got an example here shown below. Um, this happens to be the data in the uh, Hamford detector from the first gravitational wave detection, GW1509-14. Uh, There's the uh, signal whitened by the, uh, oh, I didn't mention the whitening. So the whitening is just, um, if you take the gravitational wave signal in the frequency domain and then divide by the square root of the power spectrum here, the noise spectral density, um, and then we actually transform back to the time domain that actually decorrelates the signal now. Um, so this is the whitened data, the whitened signal. You subtract it off and you get white noise. At least that's the goal. Um, <clears throat> and as we show in that paper that I referenced, uh, when you study the statistical properties of the LIGO noise, um, once you take out the gravitational wave signal, you find that it is perfectly consistent with being white Gaussian noise um, after, well, sorry, it's perfectly Gaussian after the whitening process and the subtraction of the signal. There was some controversy from a group in Denmark um, that had claimed that there were correlations still between the LIGO and 
the two LIGO detectors. And that was really because it was such a loud signal um, that if you improperly subtracted the signal, there were still correlations between the two detectors because, of course, the signal is correlated between the detectors where we hope that the noise should not be correlated. So um, it was such a loud signal that if you didn't really subtract it perfectly, you did not end up with uncorrelated Gaussian noise in the two detectors. <clears throat> so really, that's kind of everything that uh, goes into the sort of setup for the gravitational wave analysis. Um, but it's it's challenging. Um, you know, some of the waveform models, at least for the binary signals, um, if it's eccentric and uh, spinning, then you've got, say, 17 parameters. Here's an example of a highly eccentric um, <clears throat> gravitational wave signal. We haven't seen anything like this yet, but it'll be exciting when we do. Um, we have to jointly um, infer the noise properties along with the signals. So we have to model this power spectrum as well as modeling the signals. And we also have these, um, <clears throat> these non-Gaussian transients, which I'll just get this slide to refresh here. Here is the LIGO-Livingston data <clears throat> um, at the time of the first binary neutron star merger. And you see there's this extremely loud noise transient, which happened to coincide with the, um, this is the track. You can see this is a time frequency track here. Time up until merger, merger time is at zero. So this is 30 seconds of data. You see the signal sweeping up in frequency. So a classic gravitational wave chirp. And then um, about a second before merger, the, um, the signal encountered a very loud glitch in the Livingston detector. And so we had a very large non-Gaussian noise transient that uh, before we could really understand the, you know, the data and, and uh, get the properties of the signal, we had to remove this glitch. And so this, this glitch was removed by uh, my team using the Bayes wave algorithm that was mentioned earlier. So we were able to subtract off this glitch, which was like signal to noise of about 800, and we've got a signal to noise of 20 something gravitational wave signal. So this glitch was dramatically louder than the um, gravitational wave signal, but we were able to, um, you know, completely subtract it without damaging the signal, and uh, that allowed us to then extract the properties of this of this system. But prior to that. Um, if you just leave this in, it blows up all of the analysis. You just get complete junk if you if you leave this glitch in. <clears throat> all right, so most of the analysis that uh, I'm involved in uses the sort of Bayesian approach. Of course, this is Bayes' theorem. So what we're interested in is the posterior probability, which just means what we understand about the signal after we've measured the data. And... It's given by the product of the likelihood, which as we've seen is just your noise model, the prior, which is your signal model, and then this normalization factor, because these all have to integrate to unity since they're probabilities. And this integration uh, constant here is the model evidence, which is also important when comparing different models. The models with the highest evidence, are. Uh, it's also known as the marginal likelihood. Those are the favored models. So we, um, we know how to calculate the likelihood. Um, we, we provide the priors, and then we have to integrate to get this normalization. This is the costly part here. And so there's various techniques that we use um, to carry out this high dimensional integral. Um, some of the techniques are Markov chain Monte Carlo techniques, which is sort of a stochastic way to do an integral, and nested sampling, which is another sort of stochastic integration technique. And that then allows us to arrive at this um, these posterior distributions, um, which describe the waveform. So we can have different kinds of uh, signal models. So, for example, we might have a binary in spiral. We might have like a continuous gravitational wave. That, for example, might be something like a neutron star that's spinning with its uh, magnetic axis. Uh, displaced from its rotation axis, and it might then be slightly distorted. So then you get a 
essentially just a sine wave. You might have a stochastic gravitational wave signal, something from, say, some process in the early universe, like a phase transition. Then there, is, there are other gravitational wave signals, which we're trying to model, but we um, don't yet have all the physics in those numerical models. So, for example, a core collapse a supernova. There are definitely supernova waveforms out there, but I wouldn't, you know, 100% trust any of them because we're missing a lot of the a lot of the physics in the modeling of the neutron stars, uh, the proto-neutron star oscillations and that sort of thing. So there, these burst-like signals <clears throat> uh, might come from things that we know about, such as supernova, where we know they exist, core collapse supernova, but we don't really know what the signals would look like exactly. But then there's also the possibility of completely unknown signals, things that we've not thought of. So we, of course, have no models for. And how do we detect those? In the parlance of, um, of in the LIGO-Virgo collaboration, we usually talk about those being um, minimally modeled or poorly modeled, like burst signals. So we're trying to find just unexpected signals, um, maybe relatively short duration, things that go bump in the night. Um, and how do we discover those without actually already having a model? So these are some of the possible gravitational wave signals, and each of those is actually our signal model, so that's some kind of a prior. Even if you don't know what it is, you can still say something about, um, you know, for example, we might say that it's localized in time and frequency as our prior. So it's a very weak prior compared to something like a binary in spiral model, which um, ties this pattern, There's, these oscillations are closely tied to the masses and the spins of the system. Um, so that's a much more uh, defined prior. In fact, it's so well defined that it's actually a delta function. It actually maps the gravitational wave signal to a collection of parameters, which I've denoted here by lambda. And so it's actually a delta function mapping between you know, the signal that you see and some model which is given by a collection of parameters, such as the masses and the spins, the orientation of the system on the sky. Um, and then you then have probably, you have uh, some kind of prior distributions on those quantities, the, the masses and spins. For a burst signal, we might, for example, represent it just by a collection of little, little wavelets, little um, isolated in time and frequency, um, little, little atoms, um, which we can sum up to form a signal from a collection of wavelets. And then we might have a prior on, on how those might be localized, for example. And then for a stochastic signal, well, it's going to be just a Gaussian, you know, un, uh, uncorrelated uh, process, well, correlated with a some kind of a spectrum here. And what we're trying to infer in that case is what is the power spectrum of that um, stochastic signal. So we search for all of these kinds of signals, and these are all the priors that we use in the analyses. <clears throat> so, for example, if we want to detect like a burst type signal, and bursts include gravitational wave mergers of, of two black holes, um, we can actually model it. And this is what the uh, how the Bayes wave algorithm works. So here we're actually reconstructing the waveform. Um, if you look in the upper right panel, you will see a collection of wavelets. Each one's a different color. Um, they will have somewhat different amplitudes and phases. You've got this sort of orangey one, then a purpley one, blue, then a red one, a light blue, and a green. If you take all of those wavelets and add them up, you get the blue line. And the red, in this case, this was a simulation, so this was the injected signal. And that collection of wavelets add up to give you that combined signal there. And using that process here, we're able to um, detect the first gravitational wave um, merger. In fact, this was first detected by the coherent wave burst algorithm, which also uses wavelets. Um, so the first detection of gravitational waves was actually done using an unmodeled search. So we were not assuming Einstein's theory of gravity in these searches. Um, so coherent wave burst picked it up, then uh, that triggered um, the Bayes wave algorithm to then reconstruct the signal. It produced these reconstructions the day of the um, of the signal arrived, and these bands of color 
give you a probability distribution for how likely it is that the waveform actually has this particular shape, right? So this is the reconstructed waveform here as a probability distribution. And we got those on the first, uh, on that day. We're very excited because even before we, you know, had run all of the analyses using um, models based off general relativity, we knew this looked just like what we were expecting from a gravitational wave um, from a pair of black holes merging. So without actually assuming that, the data was already showing us um, exactly the kind of signal we were hoping to see. So that was an extremely exciting day uh, when we first saw these reconstructions. And these are actually from that first day. So these are the original reconstructions we got. Um, <clears throat> yeah, and then once, if you have um, a system you can model, such as a binary merger of, of two black holes, then you can actually use, say, numerical relativity or post-Newtonian or effective one-body models, all that sort of thing, to actually come up with a um, or phenomenological model that is matching to numerical relativity. You can come up with a waveform model described by a collection of parameters that can then, um, you can then use that. And you can actually, you don't then care about the individual time or frequency samples. So you integrate those out. That gets you what's known as a marginal likelihood, and that actually maps then that your like your um, posterior distribution now becomes a posterior distribution on your model parameters. So now your likelihood is just being mapped. It's this marginal likelihood because you've integrated out the individual samples, which is what Bayes wave actually produces. And this is what you probably mostly see in the in the LIGO papers, LIGO Virgo papers, um, which we map out these distributions. So for example, you will see things like the um, the individual masses of a binary system here. These are the first, you know, four detections that um, that we made. And here are some of the spin parameters. And you can see that we have these distributions for the for the parameters. So it maps what we end up with then a probability distributions for the for the parameters of the system. And this is what we really need to be able to do the astrophysics, right? We come up now with collections of systems with different masses, different spins, and that is how we can then start to talk about, you know, what properties do the population of, say, black holes or neutron stars have in the universe? And with, you know, with the latest catalog, the O3 catalog of um, black hole and black hole and neutron star and neutron, st neutron star mergers, we're really learning a lot now about um, and a lot of surprises really on on the formation channels for uh, these gravitational wave signals. <clears throat> the uh, it's challenging sometimes to actually map out these distributions. In principle, if we had to worry about eccentricity and misaligned spins, we would have um, seventeen dimensions or so just of the gravitational wave signal to map out. It might have all sorts of you know, local maxima and minima, and we've got to try and move around this space. So it can be quite difficult to um, map out these signals. Also, we have a lot of data coming in. Um, the typical LIGO-Virgo analyses, once a signal has been found, so we sort of usually have a search phase and then a characterization phase where we do this more expensive Bayesian analysis. Um, the Bayesian analysis, that's used has been used by LIGO often takes weeks or even months to to complete. Uh, it's possible to do it more quickly, but it's hard to get it down below you know minutes. Um, you know, say a few minutes to analyze, say a few seconds of data. So either you run a lot of computers or you maybe find another way. So what we typically do is search the data using uh, much more rapid techniques that are a bit more approximate in terms of pulling out the parameters. And then once we've kind of locked onto a signal, um, we can then go in and, and analyze it in more detail. So we usually do a, a search first, and then we move into this more intensive Bayesian uh, parameter estimation. Um, so for LIGO and Virgo, that's the way it's done. For LISA, it's going to be a little different. Um, first of all, we're not going to have quite as much data to deal with. Um, you know, we're sampling it at, uh, say, once every, well, five seconds or something rather than 16,000 
uh, or 20,000 samples a second. So we're not collecting quite as much data, um, but the signals tend to be on the entire mission. Many of them are on the entire mission. They last for years. So we've got, say, millions of overlapping signals that we have to try and sort out. So you can't really do a, a search followed by a more detailed analysis. You kind of have to do a more global type analysis that, that um, simultaneously tries to search for thousands of signals and characterize thousands of signals. So uh, that's very challenging. And then for pulsar timing, as I mentioned earlier, uh, it's it's challenging because the data is unevenly sampled. The noise properties are very complicated, so you can't just do a, like a Fourier transform and and go from there. So it, you know, LIGO and Virgo analysis is actually quite a bit easier than what we have coming up with um, Lisa and what we're currently doing in pulsar timing. I'm going to take a break in a minute and take some questions. So, um, in fact. I think now is a good time. Uh, maybe take a break or take questions and then take a little bit of a break. So I'll maybe take a few questions and then take a few minutes break. Yes, I would recommend to do so. So if, every, if anybody wants to ask a question, please raise his or her hand. And obviously, if somebody on the uh, YouTube channel is also wishing to ask questions. Please write down your questions and I will forward forward it. Any question? So I, I, while I wait for a question, I have a question. Um, so <clears throat> the uh, the participants, what's the um, background, uh, most are graduate students in gravitational waves or just in general, uh, like what? I should have probably asked this earlier. <laughs> yeah, uh, Neil, it's a rather mixed audience as I anticipated in one of my early emails. Actually, most of them are PhD students of the SSM and they either come from a mathematics or a physics or even an engineering background. Um, incidentally, yeah, for those who come from an engineering background, there are many of the concepts that you illustrated that, in a sense, are also or should be familiar to, to those students because they are used in different contexts. Uh, for instance, in the interpretation of uh, data from synthetic aperture others, or um, something that I often uh, said to my students is that the formula that essentially gives the output of a gravitational wave interferometric detector in terms of the F plus and F cross coefficients is pretty similar to what in antenna theory is called mm -hmm. the, effect, the effective height formula. So <laughs> it's basically the effective quadrupole of the detector that is contracted mm -hmm. with the incoming wave. So I think that many of the concepts should uh, make some bells ring in the heads of the people. Uh, what I uh, am uh, thinking is that many people are a bit intimidated because your presentation has been spanning a lot of uh, different concepts, so probably they are not, they are shy. Okay, we have uh, Lilo Toffi, guest, who is going to ask a question. Go ahead, Lilo. Hello, uh, I have a question about the signal uh, between uh, stochastic background and uh, uh, a signal like uh, 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 a pulsar, a gravitational wave from a pulsar. Are they may have, are they uh, comparable in one way, some, some way? Yeah, so, you know, so. The stochastic signals really are just a form of colored noise, right? So if you listen to them, they'd just be like a hiss, um, whereas something from a an individual pulsar that was, say, with a little bit of a bump on it would just be a pure sine wave, would just be a pure tone. Um, however, the two are related in the following sense. So the signals that we're 
interested in or expect to detect with pulsar timing, not the signals from the pulsar themselves, because they also put out gravitational waves, because a lot of them are in binaries, but they're also detectors, because we detect the, um, the time delay of their electromagnetic signals. But the signal we're looking for there, we think that it comes from a collection of supermassive black holes that are orbiting around each other, but they're orbiting very slowly. They're orbiting, you know, one completing an orbit every one, two years, that kind of thing. And they're hundreds of thousands of years, millions of years from merging. So they're just orbiting like at a very constant rate, barely changing in frequency, right? So they're each one of them is essentially putting out a sine wave. But if you add together uh, millions of sine waves, all with slightly different amplitudes and with slightly different phases, you end up with a stochastic signal, right? Just add a whole bunch of sine waves, each one with a different frequency, slightly different amplitude, slightly different phase, you do end up with a stochastic signal. So when you add all those together, you get a stochastic background, you get a stochastic signal. And so that actually happens in all of gravitational waves. Every time you start with like a few individual voices you can hear, it's like, it's like being at a party, right? You hear a few people at a party that are nearby to you, but then the rest of the room is just a, a hum of noise, right? And that's that's the way it is with pretty much every population of gravitational wave signals. So with LIGO and Virgo, right now we're detecting individual signals from you know binary black holes merging, binary neutron stars. But in addition to that, there's a whole bunch of them because they're merging, there's a merger happening every couple of minutes in the universe. When you add all of those signals up, there's a background hum. We haven't detected that hum yet. But we probably will within the next few years. So it's right, it's just a little bit quieter than the ones that are close to us, sort of shouting at us. But the ones a little further away, the combination of all of them, we expect to pick that up uh, probably during the next observing run. So we'll start to hear that hum of all the rest of the black holes and neutron stars in the universe. Um, and that's what we're looking for with pulsar timing. We, we expect, in the case of pulsar timing, we expect to hear the hum first um, and then hear the individual signals. It's just, it has to do with, you know, how many there are per frequency or how many there are per time, whether you hear the individuals first or you hear the hum first. But thank you. Neil, could you could you briefly comment about the possible relevance of time frequency based techniques? Implicitly, you already illustrated them, uh, but I think that in the perspective of setting up some kind of a hierarchical way mm -hmm. of of doing detection and then parameter estimation, probably these techniques uh, are are. Uh, a very useful tool. Can you briefly comment yes. about this? Yeah, and I have, I actually have um, some slides on that later, uh, which I'll get to. So I'm actually, I actually am a very strong advocate of, of using the time frequency approach. Um, the, you know, we use a lot currently for visualization. It's very useful for, you know, you can turn you can turn the data into a picture, which our brains is then very good at interpreting. But it also turns out that mathematically, um, if we have these signals and also this noise, which is not constant, it varies, it's much better to take, treat it in a combined time frequency mode than trying to t treat it just as in the frequency domain or the time domain, because um, these signals actually have structure in the time frequency plane that you can utilize. So, and this, it also turns out that modeling gravitational wave signals in the time frequency um, domain is also very powerful and it be, can be done very rapidly. So this, so modeling the noise, if the noise is non-stationary, you can model it very efficiently using time frequency methods. 
um, as soon as the noise is non-stationary, it's no longer producing a diagonal noise matrix in the frequency domain. So you end up with a non-diagonal matrix. It gets very difficult to estimate that the properties, the structure of that matrix. It gets very expensive to invert it. Whereas if you work in the time frequency representation, it's it's still diagonal. So you break it up into pixels of time and frequency, and those pixels are uncorrelated, even if the noise is non-stationary. So um, yeah, I have a the latter part of the talk is actually on that. So um, yeah, I'm a strong advocate for, and I know that you have also worked, um, did some very nice work using time frequency methods for, for modeling the signals and the noise and gravitational waves. And I really do think that that is the way um, forward. In fact, for the future LISA detector, we're currently switching all of our analyses to being in the time frequency domain. So all of the analysis we do is going to be using time frequency methods. We're not going to be using frequency domain. It's all going to be time frequency using wavelets and you know discrete wavelet representations. Yeah, thanks. And and uh, correct me if I'm wrong. I also think that the uh, higher order post Newtonian corrections are in a sense less sensitive in the time frequency domain compared to what you get, for instance, when you adopt phasing based uh, observables. I mean, the the uh, usually the scalar product between a signal and the template. Uh, is very very sensitive even to tiny phasing errors. Right. But it, yeah. But but in the time frequency domain, apparently, if you compare even the most basic, uh, let's say, Peters Matthews model of the time frequency trajectory of a coalescing mm -hmm. binary, and you compare it to one of these beautiful phenomenological waveforms. Well, the, the discrepancy uh, becomes evident only in the very latest part of the trajectory, which means that uh, probably you can use even pretty simple models in the in the time frequency plane in order to check what you're observing, which is an, a further bonus, in my opinion. Right. I mean, you can also, if you want, you can maintain the phasing information in the time frequency plane, right? So it's possible to have keep both. The, if, if you want, or as you say, you can work with the modulus and get rid of the phase, and that has advantages because then you are much less sensitive to um, discrepancies between your model and the data. So it's kind of, you can have it each way, right? Yeah. That sensitivity to the phasing allows you to do very precise estimation, but it's a problem if your model's not quite right because then you don't catch the signal. So you can, you know, first catch the signal using a method that, you know, wipes out the phase information, but then you can go in later and try and, you know, extract the extra information that's also in the phase. So you can you can kind of have, do it both ways. You can get, um, you can be a little bit blind to that and 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 not be thrown off by your model not being right, but then you can come back and get that extra information from the phasing. Yeah. Yeah, so much so. OK, Neil, so it's uh, 12 minutes past five. I would suggest to take three uh, additional minutes uh, just to allow people to take rest for a few yep. minutes and then we can uh, start over. OK, Sounds good. Okay. OK, see you in three minutes. OK.
Neil, I beg your pardon. I think that uh, uh, you have little screens superimposed on your uh, slides. So can you? Can you? Yeah. Okay, that's fine. Okay. Yeah, I was just doing that when I wanted to see everyone. <clears throat> All right. Okay, shall we start over? Yeah, let's keep going here. Um, I might, I'll probably skip a couple of things, but just people probably know this kind of thing. So, <clears throat> um, so for the search, the search is done more in a classical framework or a um, uh, frequentist framework where you've got the different hypotheses about noise or noise and signal, and then you have some kind of test statistic um, such that if it's uh, if your test statistic exceeds some threshold, it favors, say, the signal hypothesis, and if it's below that, it signal it favors the noise hypothesis, and then you do the usual thing of setting the different uh, false alarm and false dismissal probabilities and set up a, an analysis like that. And um, initially, we were very concerned about false alarms because we didn't want to you know, incorrectly claim that we detected gravitational waves. Now we're getting, um, we've now found many, many gravitational waves, so we're a little bit less concerned about the false alarms, and we're, you know, we maybe change the, the cutoffs a little bit there of what we look at. Um, so if you just take, if you go back to the likelihood I described earlier with that noise weighted inner product, then um, <clears throat> one of these sort of ranking statistics you might form up is this likelihood ratio. So that's the, the ratio of the um, signal model for a particular signal with a given set of parameters, and then just the pure noise model. So you just compare the likelihoods of a signal with a certain parameters to um, the noise prop. Um, the noise model, and of course, the noise model also has parameters, but uh, and that that ratio, if you actually you have to go and maximize it over the the possible parameters. So you go and search over all the possible, say, masses and spins of the black holes and sky locations and that sort of thing. Um, and what you end up with after that maximization is a statistic, which we call the row statistic, which is just the basically the inner product of the data and a unit normalized template. Um, so just simply maximizing that. And so this would be the, the simplest sort of search statistic if the noise was stationary and Gaussian. Um, I'm, not gonna, I'm gonna skip this. It's related to, this quantity is related to the signal to noise um, squared. So uh, if, if the data, this is all just completely the theoretical this is not really what we do in practice, but um, if the noise was was Gaussian distributed, then this so-called row statistic would be Gaussian distributed, and the distribution for the null hypothesis would be this Gaussian distribution. The the distribu distribution for the the noise model would be a shifted Gaussian, and then you can set your various like uh, your threshold row star, then gives you the false alarm probability, the false dismissal, or just these error functions just from this Gaussian distribution. And then you can actually um, set a, a signal to noise threshold. In the case of LIGO Virgo analyses, we actually set a false alarm threshold. And the false alarm rate is just the, the probability of a false alarm divided by the observation time. So, for example, if you want to be really conservative and say, OK, I want a false alarm rate of once in a million years um, for an observation. So in a year's worth of observations, the chance of it being a false alarm is one in a million. Sorry, one in a million years in a false alarm, uh, you know, in, a, in one year of observations. So that corresponds to a um, false alarm rate of 10 to the minus six, which is 4.9 sigma. So if you want to, you know, like a five sigma type detection, that's that's corresponds to roughly <clears throat> Um, a false alarm once in a million years. Now, in practice, it's not that simple because the data is not Gaussian, and so we cannot just assume these distributions. We have to um, estimate what the actual distributions are of the of the noise and signal hypotheses directly from the data. Um, 
The way that the searches are done is this inner product actually sets up a Riemannian metric on the space of signals, and then you can actually set up a, um, sorry, the, the match defines this, this metric, which you can calculate, and this is a, gives a full Riemannian geometry with curvature and everything. And then you can actually set it up that you grid up this um, space, which is a d-dimensional um, lattice, because you've got, say, two masses and a couple of spins and then various other parameters. So you end up with this lattice that you have to cover. Um, that cost of that search grows geometrically with the number of parameters, so it can get very expensive. In the case of LIGO and Virgo, we use various tricks to maximize over a bunch of the parameters. Um, and then the idea is that you just sort of search over this grid. This is just a two-dimensional grid and then pick out the, the point that has, you know, the highest um, response and or the largest value. And you do this for each. So I'm going to probably skip a bit of this. It turns out you can maximize over things like the distance. You can maximize over the phase offsets using the signal and quadrature, phase zero and phase pi on two. So you can actually just um, analytically maximize over that phase. And the time offset, since everything is normally being done in the Fourier domain, you can use the periodicity of the signals in the Fourier domain to automatically search over all possible time delays of that um, between the signal and the data there. So we're actually able to take out a bunch of the parameters just analytically. Um, and then we just have to search over um, masses and spins, for example, for the rest of the parameters. And there's really just one combination of the spins that we're most sensitive to. These signals so far, we don't search over eccentricity currently. Um, so really, these are typically three-dimensional grids that we lay out and search over. Um, yeah, so this is what we end up using, this statistic, which allows us to automatically search over, um, maximize over time, phase, and distance. <clears throat> In practice, it's a little bit um, trickier because we've got, say, multiple detectors. You have to calculate what you think the power spectrum is to get an estimate for your noise model. You then match in each detector. We do it detector by detector. We compare against a filter bank. We get this uh, statistic. Um, then we actually look for things happening coincidence. We know that between the two LIGO detectors, a gravitational wave, if it's traveling at the speed of light, should have a delay of at most 10 milliseconds. Between LIGO and Virgo detectors, it's around 20 milliseconds. So we look for things that have the appropriate, you know, uh, arrived coincident within the, the light travel time of a gravitational wave. Then are the parameters consistent? Um, and then uh, we actually also have to calibrate all of this by looking at a bunch of simulated signals um, it's just in words, what I just said. Um, and what we have to do is calibrate the search by trying it out on fake data. But the way we, we fake the data is we use the real data, but we just shift it in time. And if you shift it in time by more than, say, a second or so, that breaks the coherence of any gravitational wave signal. And so you can just treat the two detected data, or, you know, the data streams now is just being noise because you know that you've killed any um, gravitational wave signals by breaking their. So you can just repeat the search over and over using time shifted data, and that gets you um, allows you to Monte Carlo the properties of these statistics. So you don't have to assume they're Gaussian. You actually calculate the um, how these statistics behave just through um, this, this Monte Carlo simulation. So. This means that you know all of these different kinds of these are all time frequency maps, frequency vertically, time horizontally here. These are all some of these kinds of noise transients we see in in the detectors. And uh, these ring off on the search template banks. So we can kind of calibrate for that by repeating the search over and over on time shifted data where we've killed any gravitational waves. So we know we're just getting the kind of background properties. So that establishes the background distributions. So whenever we find something above that background, we go, huh, that's probably a gravitational wave signal. So this is what it looked like for the first um, detections and then the first catalogs. So we've got these backgrounds here. These are Monte Carloed. This first Monte Carloed background here actually included 
this one signal, which would sometimes ring off against glitches, but if you subtract that signal, the background kind of looks like this. And you see up here, here's the statistical significance. This is a hugely significant result. There's a couple of other lower significance detections that we made in the first uh, in the first um, run of LIGO, and then we you know later were joined by the Virgo detector. And here's for the the catalog. We see all of these events here are just completely off the charts. They're so far above the inferred background dis distribution, which are these shaded gray bands, that these are all very these ones in particular are extremely confident detections. And these are all of the, the signals we have. And now we have of order 50 something events. But this is all a Monte Carlo background. Um, we don't just assume it's Gaussian. <clears throat> so that's, you know, the searches are done like that. And um, then we go about then inferring the parameters. And I've, I've said a little bit about that. So in this, in this Bayesian approach, um, it's really a, a natural expression of the scientific method because you've got your initial understanding, you fold in your new observations, and that's your updated understanding. And so you've got your prior distribution, the new observations or the likelihood, the product of those then gives you the posterior, which you have to normalize. So that's just this process of taking what you already know, updating it with observations, and then that's your posterior is what you then know after the um, and that's expressed by Bayes' theorem here. So we, the trick is how do you actually calculate this high dimensional integral? And that's where we use, like I said, these techniques like uh, Markov chain Monte Carlo and nested sampling. Once you have that posterior distribution, it tells you everything you wanna know. For example, if you just want some point estimate, like the expectation value of a parameter, so the, the expected value of the mass, expectation value of the mass, you just, um, calculate that weighted by the probability distribution. Um, if you just want to know the probability distribution of one parameter, you just integrate out all the others, right? So you marginalize out all the others, and that just makes a one-dimensional distribution, say, for the mass or the spin. And then you can also define quantiles. Um, where does, say, 90% of the probability lie? That gets you sort of an error region, right? This is the, the region that, you know, with 90% certainty contains the param, you know, the parameters lie within this band. So you can calculate the posterior dis distribution contains everything you could ask. Um, and as Laplace put it, <clears throat> the Bayesian theory of probabilities is basically just common sense reduced to calculus. Um, Lindley, who's a statistician or uh, in in UK, he put it slightly differently. He said. Today's posterior is tomorrow's prior. That's this sort of updating of what we know as we fold in new data. And in fact, you can actually measure how much we learn um, using a distance between probability distributions, this kullback uh, liebler divergence, which actually measures in bits the amount of information you gain. It's the difference between the posterior distribution and the prior distribution weighted by the posterior it actually tells you how much you've learned, and if the posterior and the prior are the same, you haven't learned anything. So if the two distributions are the same, this is log of one, which is zero, so you've learned nothing. So the more different your view of things is after the observation than it was before, the more you've learned, right? <clears throat> so when you look at something like the spins that we're measuring with some of the first LIGO detections, the green line here is the prior distribution, and then the black line is the sort of aggregate using the different models that we have. That's the posterior distribution. And you can see that the, the prior and the posterior are a bit different, but not hugely so. So if you actually measure how much do we learn about the spins, it's way less than one bit of information. So we, didn't, we haven't learned very much about spins because we don't measure those very well typically, but we have learned a lot about masses. So the mass, the mass distribution was, you know, a broad distribution, and now we now we we learn a lot about the mass of each system, but we don't learn much about the spins. And then the other important quantity was this evidence, and so we can quote like odds ratios between models. If we have two different models, then you end up with the the prior odds. Like if you preferred one model to another going in, you then calculate this Bayes factor, which is the ratio of the evidence. 
and that um, that gives you uh, you know you can update like if you preferred one model to begin with, but then after comparing it with the data, you might actually find that you now start preferring the other model. So you can say compare models like is general relativity the correct uh, description of gravity or some other theory. And so you, after you've made your observations, you can say, okay, is, is the data more consistent with Einstein's theory or some alternative theory of gravity? And so we can calculate these kind of phase factors between different, between different models. And so all of it comes down to how do we, the machinery of this is these techniques um, for computing these. And I'm not going to, I'm actually going to skip going through that machine. I've got way too many slides, so I'm going to skip ahead. Um, I might just show one in action here. Hopefully some of you have um, worked with these techniques. Here's a little animation where using one of these stochastic sampling, the, the bands here are the probability distribution. And then the stochastic sampling is going to build up samples and um, these. So it's randomly trying at new places. The green or the red depends whether it proposes jumps to new places in parameter space. The red means it wasn't accepted. The green means it was accepted. Um, and you just kind of repeat stochastically this process. And if it's if it's not accepted, you just kind of record the current point again, and that builds up a probab probability distribution. And just by this process of stochastic sampling, where you propose a new point, and then you evaluate whether you should move there or not, um, repeating that over and over, you can actually recover this full probability distribution, or at least map it out approximately. And that's what these techniques are into, you know, uh, essentially are doing. And then there's all sorts of techniques there and machinery, but I'm I'm not going to go into that today. I want to keep on moving here. So um, if we want to look at how is information encoded in a gravitational wave signal, well, during the in spiral phase, we can actually model it by taking Einstein's equations and solving them um, approximately, doing an expansion in the um, in the gravitational potential or equivalently in the velocity of the system, ex expansion in the orbital velocity um, compared to the speed of light. So this parameter U here, which is the chirp mass, which is a combination of the masses, the individual masses times the frequency to the one third power, that's just Kepler's law, gives you the velocity basically. So it's really an expansion in the orbital velocity and it's what's known as the post-Newtonian expansion. Um, <clears throat> And that can be used to model the sort of early, sort of slow adiabatic in spiral. And then the final merger and then the ringing down of the distorted black hole, that can be um, modeled using perturbation theory. And there was a very nice paper uh, a couple of years ago by Sean McWilliams showing how this calculation can be done um, and actually carried all the way through merger and ring down. So in this case, his model, the backwards one body model, um, shown in blue and in red, uh, is um, from the most precise numerical relativity predictions. His model really should start working from right around the peak on, onwards, and you can see that it does. That's all the way through merger and ring down. Um, it matches very beautifully the, the numerical relativity results. So we can actually model the late part of the signal and the early part, and you can actually join it together and end up with an analytic model all the way through. Um, so we can approximately solve Einstein's equations, glue together solutions um, in the sort of single body final merge black hole and the early adiabatic in spiral, join them together and get a complete um, waveform. This post-Newtonian part describing the early in spiral, you know, you break it up into it's actually given in powers of velocity squared. So it goes, we call it zero, which is the, the lowest order term. And then this is actually velocity squared is the 1 PN. The 1.5 PN is actually velocity cubed. That's why we end up with this funny one and a half. It's actually velocity cubed. And then we have velocity to the fourth and it goes on and on. We're up to something like uh, velocity 
to the eighth power in, in various um, terms now. And this first term encodes this combination of masses known as the chirp mass. The second term gives us eta here as the mass ratio. So the, the next term in the expansion encodes information about the individual masses. The next term, the velocity cube term, tells us about a particular combination of the spins. The next term gives us measurements of the individual spins, but each one sort of progressively um, less well constrained by the data. So that's why we measure these combinations of the masses, which is this uh, contour here, which is a contour of constant chirp mass, whereas the final merger and ring down measures mostly the total mass. Um, and then the spins, you can see these, these shaded regions of the probability distribution for the spins and the alignments. You see that they're very broad. They're not very well constrained because that, that information is encoded in higher order terms that aren't don't have as bigger impact on the signal. So what we get best is this chirp mass and the total mass, and then the spins, which are encoded at higher order, are not nearly so well constrained. And you can see that in particular with the first binary neutron star merger. Um, <clears throat> you can see this line here. This is mass one and mass two. You can see that the probability distribution we end up with is this really long, uh, curved shape. This is a line of constant chirp mass. So the chirp mass, this particular combination of the masses, is measured really well, but we cannot measure the infer the individual masses very well. Um, we do better if we assume that the spins are small, because uh, it's a degeneracy with the spin terms that's causing this, mostly. So if we assume that the spins are small, then we we end up with a better determination of the masses. And these are the kinds of spins we would expect for a binary for neutron stars. Um, but yeah, you can see the individual masses are very broad distributions, but we have a very tight constraint on this combination, the chirp mass. But what we really want to know are the individual masses. So that's kind of unfortunate that we have this degeneracy. Um, and you can see that <clears throat> uh, if you look at all the spin measurements, there's these different combinations of the spins. This measures the spin, a combination of the spins aligned with the orbital angular momentum, and this that's chi effective, and chi p measures a combination of the spins which causes them to process. So it's a out of alignment with the angular momentum direction. And you see that um, we have pretty broad, these numbers range between minus one and one for this quantity and zero and one for chi chi p, and you see that these um, violin plots for the probability distributions for the precession component are pretty much just unconstrained. And most of the spins that we've measured are pretty much consistent with zero, but there's big error bars on them. We've since measured some systems uh, in the second catalog and the third catalog. We've now got more systems that show evidence of, of spin and actually precession. But early on, we were not seeing any of those. Um, and the problem there is because um, the top waveform, you can't really see the individual cycles here, but this is um, what it looks like. Uh, I'm just going to, sorry, go to this. Sorry. Um, you can't see the individual cycles, but this is the waveform for a non-spinning black hole merger viewed face on, whereas the second waveform shown here in the time domain is for a spinning black hole where you're observing it aligned with the total angular momentum direction. This is exactly the same system, the same um, spinning black hole system, but now observing it inclined at some angle uh, pi on six to the total angular momentum direction, inclined at pi on three, and then pi on two, so edge on. So you're seeing it. And it's a bit like if you're observing, imagine a plate is sort of wobbling if you're viewing it face on, it's hard to see the plates wobbling. But if you see it edge on, you can see the plate wobbling really easily. Um, so it would be very obvious that the system was spinning if you are viewing it edge on, whereas if you view it face on, it's really hard to see that it's spinning and processing. And the problem is um, there's a selection effect, which means we're much more likely to see systems face on because they tend to put out their gravitational waves dominantly go out 
in the direction orthogonal to the angular momentum, so we mostly view things face on. So it's very hard to tell the difference between a spinning black hole and a non-spinning black hole because you can't see that wobbling when you view them face on. And we're much more likely to see them face on because they're spurting the gravitational waves right at us then. Um, this is this factor <clears throat> where this is the inclination angle and you see that it's um, <clears throat> we're highly weighted towards ones that at inclination zero, so face on, whereas inclination pi on t to this um, this factor is much smaller. So we mostly see face on or face off systems. And we're also much more sensitive to high mass systems and the luminosity distance goes inversely with that squared. So we're much more sensitive to nearby sources. Um, so this is what we tend to see is uh, face on or face off systems and high mass systems. So we're prejudiced to see those more than small low mass systems. Um, so just a little uh, on some of the more advanced techniques. As I mentioned earlier with this future um, LISA detector, space-based detector, uh, we don't know. Uh, there's going to be huge numbers of signals all overlapping with unknown parameters, and we don't know how many of those signals are going to be detectable. So we actually don't really know the dimension of the space that we're trying to search. Uh, in the case of LIGO and Virgo and also these other detectors, we also are interested in trying to find um, unmodeled gravitational waves. Um, so we we can mo model those as a collection of wavelets, but we don't know how many wavelets should we add to the model. And then when we're modeling the noise and the power spectra, there's all sorts of features there. How many features should we include in the modeling? So if you don't know, if you don't want to specify in advance how complex the model is, what you allow, use a method where the complexity of the model gets selected by the data. So you let the data decide how complicated your model should be. So you allow, you explore all possible or, or a large number of possible um, mo models of differing complexity, and the data then will um, help you decide between how complex the model should be so you don't overfit the data or you know we don't want to fit it well enough. So I've got an example um, of how this works. And so essentially what you do is you make the model dimension a parameter as well. That's what we mean by transdimensional is not only are the parameters of the model um, being explored, but also how many parameters to use. So here's a really simple example. <clears throat> this happens to be a polynomial um, with uh, of order D, and we have 32 data points here. So you, you want to fit some kind of a polynomial to this. So you can measure the chi-squared, which goes into the likelihood, and you see that if you use a, um, a polynomial with degree 32, you get a chi-squared of zero. You can get a perfect fit. If you use a, you know, you've got 32 data points. If your model has 32 parameters, you can get a chi-squared of zero, right? But you're clearly overfitting the data. So um, if we dial down the model dimension here to uh, the best fit degree 24 polynomial, it's still overfitting the data. We dial it down to 16, it's looking, looking better. Down to eight, still doing a pretty good job. By the time we're down to dimension four, um, the model's now a bit too simple. We're not fitting the data very well. So how do we actually, um, you know, rather than doing this by eye or just like looking at the chi-squared or the chi-squared per degree of freedom, which is the sort of frequentist way, in the Bayesian way of doing this, you <clears throat> allow the model dimension to vary and the parameters of the model. And here's just a few draws from a posterior distribution. So this was just stochastically sampled. The <clears throat> code was trying out different um, model dimensions. And you can see this is on a logarithmic scale. It really liked dimension seven. Uh, it sometimes tried out dimension eight, nine, and 10. Never really liked dimension six. So it varied the model dimension, varied the parameters of the polynomials. And these are just, these lines here are, are just uh, different draws from the, the sampling that it did. So it was exploring these different models. And it says, I really like, you know, this data is really well described by a degree seven polynomial. Um, maybe degree eight, but that's getting too complicated. So it balances, um, you pay a cost in Bayesian analysis for 
model complexity, sort of an Occam penalty for models that are too complex. And so it balances goodness of fit against model complexity just sort of naturally. Um, so this is the standard technique that we use in most of our analyses in my group is let the data kind of pick the model complexity for you. And for example, this is in Bayes wave, we have a collection of wavelets and we use it to me measure both uh, the signals, the glitches and the noise. And just uh, for example, if you wanna measure, this is the power spectrum. This is just a periodogram showing the Hanford, Livingston and Virgo um, from the, uh, even this is earlier, this was even before we started advanced Virgo or advanced LIGO. This is back in the sixth science run of the initial detectors. We have all of these different lines. Um, so we model all of these. So we have for sort of the overall smooth component, we use a cubic spline where the control points and their value and how many control points is variable. And then these lines we model, model by Lorentzians and how many Lorentzians there are is up to the data to decide. We just throw it, throw them in there randomly and sort of see uh, how many it wants to fit all these different lines. So we model all of those. We have all of these glitches, which we can model. Um, this is an, again a time frequency map, frequency vertically, time horizontally. So we can throw in a bunch of wavelets to uh, model these excess Excess, excess power in the time frequency plane. We don't know how many wavelets we need to model these, so we allow that to be a variable number of wavelets, so a sum of wavelets where there's an unknown number that we're going to use. And then signals, again, as I showed earlier, we can model them as a collection of wavelets, and we don't know how many, so we just allow the data to vary the number of wavelets and allow all that to go. And here is a little animation on the left this is uh, the upper is the Hanford data, the lower is the Livingston data, and this is going to be an animation. And it'll actually show from the analysis that we did the day the signal arrived uh, what the code was trying out. It was throwing in these wavelets. This is where it all started out, had a wavelet um, in the signal model, and then it's also modeling the um, the power spectrum, and then it just varies it, right? So it's trying out it's varying the number of Lorentzians and where they're placed, it's varying the, um, the, the smooth component of the, and you can see it's trying out these different wavelets here, it keeps on adding some in and it decides it doesn't like, that they're not really adding anything to the story, so it throws them out again. So you just take this and you, you know, it repeats this over millions of times and you end up coming up with these probability distributions for the signal and you also end up with probability distributions for the for the noise model. And if there was any glitches, um, these noise transients in the detectors, it models those as well. So um, we have, it's basically you can see it trying out all the different models dimensions. There's actually at the end of the day <clears throat> hundreds of parameters in these models that are being explored. Um, I'm going to skip that bit. Um, so some of the challenges, I've already mentioned these, some of the signals are very complicated. We might have signals that are, you know, the spin orbit coupling means that they process around. We might have um, eccentricity. So we have high dimensional models with the future uh, LISA instrument. We have a complicated instrument response as I described, and then there's thousands and thousands of overlapping signals. The data can also be non-stationary and non-Gaussian. Um, these are again time frequency maps showing uh, excesses in, in some of the LIGO data. This is actually what a gravitational wave signal looks like in the discrete uh, wavelet domain. This is a binary black hole merger. And uh, <clears throat> if we actually switch to use a discrete wavelet transformation, then the noise model, which if we take to be this like same Gaussian, the I's and J's and K's and L's here, here I is time and K is L. So these each pixel has a label in time and frequency. It turns out that um, if the noise is sort of adiabatically varying, um, 
if the spectrum is adiabatically varying, it's known as an evolutionary spectrum or a um, dynamic spectrum. If it's doing it sort of adiabatically, like slowly, then this noise correlation matrix is diagonal in the wavelet domain. So it's again very easy to invert a diagonal matrix. And so it's much easier to do the analysis in the wavelet domain um, when the and so this is what, for example, in LIGO, the coherent wave burst algorithm uses discrete wavelets. And this is what we now use um, for all of our analyses for LISA. And we're actually shifting also all of our LIGO analysis my group does is getting shifted to the wavelet domain as well um, so that we can use the fact that uh, we can do the. So we actually now model, for example, the noise both both in time and in frequency. So for example, you use splines in bicubic uh, bi splines that go both in time and frequency. And then here's an example of some non-stationary noise. So you can see here's in the time domain. Here are the samples. It gets kind of noisier as it goes along. And so this has this is a you know correlated um, noise, and then it's also varying. Uh, noise level is varying. This is what it looks like in the time frequency domain. You can see that it actually, um, well, it's colored, right? It, it's, uh, it's on a log scale, so it's got, um, it has more power at low frequencies than high frequencies, but then you can see in time, um, the noise gets much louder, and then it gets quieter again, and so we're able to um, model this varying noise level with time and it's all you can show when you actually check numerically that the individual pixels are uncorrelated in the time frequency domain so allows us to um, and then we can actually model waveforms and it actually turns out that it's faster to calculate likelihoods and model waveforms directly in the wavelet domain because if you look at a typical in spiral signal it sweeps up along this line in time frequency <clears throat> so if you have n data points and you've broken it up into time and frequency, then there's roughly root n data points in the frequency and root n data points in time. So any line in this space has, has length root n. So the cost of calculating a waveform and the likelihood scales as root n. Instead of in the frequency domain, it scales as n. In the time domain, scales as n, but of course in the time domain, then this inversion scales like n cubed. And when you're talking about, you know, tens of millions of points, root n is a much better scaling to have. That's like a thousand operations rather than a million operations. So it's dramatically faster to calculate the likelihoods using uh, wavelet domain directly. And so I, uh, if you want to see the details of all the math behind this, uh, I have a paper from last year that goes through all the nitty gritty detail, details of how you actually calculate these waveforms in the time frequency domain directly. All right, coming to the close here. <clears throat> um, so, as I mentioned, you really have to understand your noise to be able to extract the parameters of your signals correctly. So, Here's the classic example of, of that happening. This was GW170817, the first binary neutron star. I've always shown this before. This is the gravitational wave signal sweeping up um, in a chirp in the Livingston detector, and there was this giant glitch. Well, we can subtract that out. Here's an example, similar kind of thing, not quite as big a glitch. This happened, uh, this is one of the signals from the um, third LIGO Virgo um, observing run. This was GW19092402182. Notice that we've now got more digits. We've got so many gravitational waves we've had to append, um, you know, the sort of hours and minutes and stuff and like a like timestamp, not just a day now. Anyway, you can see that this one, there was a glitch that intersected the signal. Um, and so this is happening fairly commonly now. It happened for roughly 20% of the signals now encounter glitches. Um, so we have to worry about this, that if we don't take into account these noise transients when we're doing the analysis, we can throw off our, our parameter estimates. So 
um, <clears throat> what we're now doing is jointly um, inferring. So here's an example where we simulated a signal and in the Hanford detector, everything was pretty clean, but in the Livingston detector, there was a big, uh, it was a big glitch. This is not a. This was a scattering arch. It's a particular kind of noise transient, nasty one. And we simultaneously model the signals and the glitches. Um, here we're using a a model based on um, general relativity, not wavelets, to model a signal. And if you actually look then um, at the parameters, so if you here's actually an ex a different example where we've got a different kind of glitch, a blip glitch intersecting a gravitational wave signal in one of the detectors. Look what happens. Focus first on the panel in the left, and this is, I think, about my last slide or close to it. Um, if you, the true parameters are shown by the big red stars and also in the one-dimensional distributions by these lines. And the orange is if you just do the standard analysis um, <clears throat> Whereas the blue is an analysis that simultaneously models the signals and the glitches and the instrument noise. And you'll notice that the orange ones are kind of displaced from the true values. We know what the true values are because it's a simulated signal. It's particularly bad when it comes to the distance and inclination. So the blue analysis here, the, the, these, these posterior distributions here in blue, modeled simultaneously the glitch in the Hanford detector and the signal, whereas the orange um, ignored the glitch and just modeled the gravitational waves. And if you look, the distance there came out at like, uh, you know, 500, 600 megaparsecs. It came out an inclination of about 0.8 or so, whereas the true values, the distance is almost twice as far away and uh, the inclination is very close to one. So you can see that the, the orange distribution doesn't even encompass the true value at all. You always expect them to be a bit displaced because noise pushes things a little bit, just Gaussian noise pushes the distributions a little bit off from the true values, the injected values. But here, because the glitch was not modeled, it completely threw it off. So you would actually infer the distance to this source you would be out by more than a factor of two. Um, and that would really, if if that sort of thing was happening when you form up all these different catalogs of gravitational wave signals, that would really throw off um, what you inferred about the population of black holes because you'd have them at completely the wrong distances in the universe and things like that. So this is just one example of how um, modeling the noise is critical um, for properly extracting the, the parameters. So I think I'll stop there and just take any final questions. Um, and I'll share the full set of slides uh, if people are interested as well. Thank you very much. I'm pretty much interested, incidentally. Uh, <laughs> are there any questions on behalf of the audience? I have a couple, but <laughs> I want to give the possibility to the audience to make their own questions first. We have a, 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 a remarkable collection of shy people today. <laughs> <laughs> OK, Neil, I have a couple of, of questions or maybe or maybe comments. The first one is that uh, 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 one thing that I've always been asking myself is, if there is any preferred time frequency representation, because you know the wavelets are fine because they are linear essentially. This is probably the the uh, the best benefit that they give. But on the other hand, the fact that by the very construction they give you a non-uniform resolution across the time frequency plane can can be an issue. Uh, on the other hand, if you take other alternatives like the Hilbert Wang or mm -hmm. the Vigna, or the Wigner wheel on which I've been working mm -hmm. and still I'm working, uh, they have the problem of being essentially nonlinear representation. So there is the plague of artifacts. Right. And 
yeah, and and so you have to find a way uh, to to uh, to cure these artifacts, and this is not. I mean, I I don't think that there is a a last uh, answer to this problem in the sense that right. you can do reassignment or you can do uh, compressed coding or uh, compressed sensing or whatever it is, but uh, it doesn't fix the problem uh, completely. One interesting thing that uh, uh, we found, for instance, is that this problem of having a uniform resolution turns out to be important when you have a source that is radiating several harmonics, like in the case of an elliptical orbit. Because mm -hmm. what happens, at least we made many simulations of these kind of systems, there appears to be a strange phenomenon whereby if the resolution is non-uniform, instead of getting several lines in the time frequency plane, you get something like a very steep blob that uh, incidentally reminds some of the time frequency tracks that have been observed on signals for which uh, the uh, modeling with a, a, a circular orbit was not completely convincing. But this, this obviously is, is still something to come. Incidentally, when it, when it comes, for instance, to studying processing systems, uh, the the waveforms, uh, maybe the, the best way to look at differences between the effects of precession and that of eccentricity is right in the time frequency plane. Am I correct? Yeah. And so, you know, it, the, the issues you're bringing up are particularly critical when you want to use the sort of power, say, in the time frequency plane for detection. Um, in what I was describing here, I was using the time, the discrete time frequency representation um, to calculate the likelihoods, but I was using, in this case, completely like uh, analytic waveform models. And so, as you know, these discrete representations are lossless, right? They contain exactly the same information as the time domain, they contain exactly their linear, their, you know, preserve all the information. So here the critical choice, and you know, so you can choose, um, as you know, the pixels, each of the pixels that I'm showing here has area one half. So the product of the um, extent in frequency times the extent in time equals one half, but you can choose, you know, are you gonna make it very long in frequency and very short in time or vice versa? That's, you know, the Heisenberg Gabor uncertainty principle. <clears throat> and certainly for representations like looking at it or even separating tracks, it definitely makes a big difference what you choose for the the frequency or the time resolution. If you you know how how you slice it up, right? Um, but it it contains all the information regardless. What becomes for what I was doing, what I've been using it for, what's important. I didn't sort of put some of the caveats in when I was saying that um, for these discrete wavelet transforms that you actually get a diagonal representation. You have to be a little careful here because you can, there's a limit in which if I make these um, wavelets very extended in frequency and very narrow in time, I recover the time domain and vice versa if I go, the opposite, uh, yeah. yeah, you can kind of go all the way. So actually to have this, um, this leads to a good approximation uh, diagonal representation, you have to make sure that the extent in time of the pixels is short compared to the time scale over which the noise is changing. So if the, t no. if the noise is changing, say, on one second time scales, you have to make sure the pixels are less than one second wide. So, yeah, the, low, my, the one condition that I have to make sure I satisfy here is that the pixels extent in time is short compared to the time scale over which the noise is varying. Um, but I'm only using, I'm really using the discrete representation here to model the noise. I'm representing like the, you know, binary mergers and everything 
you, you know, using uh, analytic models and just transforming them to the wavelet domain. I'm in this particular application. I'm not directly using the time frequency, um, you know, excess power or whatever for detection. So um, it's not as critical the choice of of basis here because it's. But I, the main thing I need to do is make sure that I'm keeping my pixels small enough so that I I can get this um, diagonal basis. But I know for your applications, you're interested in using it more for, you know, the detection, and then it really matters um, the the choice of basis and these different kinds of representations that are nonlinear. Yeah. Yeah. And incidentally, something that uh, is is also interesting is that you apparently lose very little if instead of using the waveforms as they are before making a TF representation, mm -hmm. in, a, in a sense, you digitize them using a very small number of bits to encode them. Yes. Ideally, ideally, even a, a one bit coding of the waveforms produces relatively sharp tracks in the time frequency domain. So, I mean, there is probably still a lot of things to be to be optimized in time frequency in practical time frequency analysis but i don't want to steal time to <laughs> our <laughs> to our audience there is a a question on behalf of kamran who say hi prof cornish i want to do some statistical analysis on the pure or intrinsic noise of gravitational wave observatories uh, i use the public data files from gwsc and then I choose an eventless and glitchless segment, filter the spectral lines, whiten and bandpass filter it between 10 and 2,000 uh, hertz. Can mm -hmm. I consider the result, the pure IDEST internal characteristic noise of a detector? Can I, I can add the question, does <laughs> such a thing exist as a pure internal characteristic noise of a detector? I mean, you've already you've already selected. Uh, you said that you selected, you know, sort of glitch free. I mean, of course, we determine that right by some method. You don't know in advance that you've picked out a bit that's glitch free, and there's not there's no such thing really as glitch free data, because when you actually look at the distribution, it's it's like this the distribution of asteroid sizes. There's not very many really big asteroids, like the ones that wiped out the dinosaurs. It's a power law, right? There's a few very big ones, and then there's increasingly more and more little ones. So with there are essentially glitches happening all the time. And then once you get down to lots of little ones, by the central limit theorem, the combination of lots of little glitches just becomes Gaussian. So at some point, the collection of all the little tiny glitches becomes Gaussian noise. So, you know, what you're sort of saying is that you've selected some period of time from one of the detectors where there aren't any of the sort of really big dinosaur kind of killer type glitches around, but there's still going to be a bunch of like smaller ones. And yeah, that's somewhat representative, but the, the detectors are non-stationary. So there's no particular chunk of time that you can choose that's you know fully rep you know it there's it's different every day it's different every hour so there isn't a um that's what we mean by non-stationary there is no consistent statistical you know properties to the detectors i mean they don't vary dramatically so you can certainly find chunks of time where the behavior is fairly consistent from one day to the next but there's no such thing as one chunk of data that just represents the detectors. It, it, it changes all the time. It's non-stationary. Um, but there are certainly some times when the detectors are fairly quiet and you can definitely get um, a good sense of just what the, the power spectrum looks like without it getting distorted by, you know, pops, pops and crackles. But yeah, there is no such thing as perfectly clean LIGO or Virgo data. Come around. Do you want to add something to your question? Cameron? No, maybe not. Okay, and uh, yeah. 
Yeah, mm -hmm. and, and, and incidentally, the fact that when you have these very small glitches that probably occur at a higher and higher rate, the smaller mm -hmm. they get, probably the, this also entails the fact that the firing rate will be non-stationary for these small right. level glitches. And this probably explains why we observe this kind of breathing Gaussian floor. Right. Um, I think that this part is is very is very fascinating. Kamran is uh, thanking you, Professor Cornish, for for the answer. And um, okay, any other questions on behalf of the uh, Teams virtual classroom audience? Folks, don't be shy. There are no <laughs> obvious questions. There are no <laughs> obvious questions. There are uh, all questions are useful. All right. Well, it was a lot of material, a lot to digest. Hopefully. Yeah, 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 <laughs> there was. OK, Neil, I thank you very much for your beautiful presentation. I think that there were so many inspiring slides. Uh, you know, as Feynman used to say, science is no good because for every uh, answer it gives, it makes five additional questions. <laughs> <laughs> but this makes our business amusing in a sense and this is why after all we are still working in this field so well it was a great lecture thank you so much well thank you and again i hope to see everyone in, in person sometime in the future at, thank uh, you Sanofi. neil thank you so much hope, neil. hoping that next time you will be in naples yes definitely i'd love to come to naples so um i will i'll get out there tonight thank you no problem. All right. Thank you. Thank you. Bye bye. Thank you. Sa Sa Salvatore, just a second. You were mentioning the possibility of having a special issue uh, of, of uh, uh, the journal that uh, you are the editor, the, the main editor, about uh, maybe collecting all the lectures that have been given in this school. Yes. yes uh, I, I think it will be very interesting, not only for the students, but even for us to have the lectures collected somewhere both yes. in a uh, both in a how to say a informal uh, settling like uh, like like the lessons have been given uh, for the sake of our students so far but also maybe in a, a paper like organized fashion to to go on this special issue i don't know uh, please uh, uh, let us know something more okay. about this. Let the speaker know. Yeah, yeah. Yes, yeah. Yes. Let okay. the speaker know something more about this. Okay. okay. Neil, thanks again. I. Right. Again, Neil. Yeah. Enjoy I. I, I, Enjoy I, 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 I don't want. I don't want to change your vacation schedule, uh, <laughs> asking you to visit us in the southern part of Italy. But please, the next time. Uh, yes, next time I'll be there. Yeah. <laughs> include us in your in your schedule okay thank right. you so much thank you so much again See bye, -bye. bye bye thank you bye. thank you very much bye bye thank you good morning